Jackie claimed I invaded her privacy. I don't believe I did. Once you're a celebrity, always a celebrity, you have to face it. You're a celebrity, you're fair game in public areas. And Jackie was fair game. The role of the paparazzi when I shot in the 60s, 70s, and even the 80s it was great freedom. It was a golden era, one to one. You could move about. You gotta get good angles for expression. That's my forte, to get the genuine expressions on their face. The face is the main thing. So I would attack, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say attack. I would approach celebrities, and if they protested, I would stop and honor their wishes. Number one, you have to have a car. You cannot rely on taxis, because they're not gonna pass lights. You have to hide, of course, without looking to the viewfinder. You want to get eye contact. You have to see people, windows of limousines. Like, you put the camera and the strobe close to the window to penetrate the light so you don't get a reflection. That's how I got the great pictures of Mick Jagger with his eyes, lips open, his mouth open. When you look at celebrities and you see the circle of cameramen around them. I always think of Piranha snapping. When you think about it, the first Piranha was Ron Galella, only he was a shark because he swam alone. That stuff didn't exist before Galella. You have to create your own standards and live by them. Galella was the first. There is a direct line of descent. The center of Manhattan was my Golden City to shoot pictures. And Jackie was my golden girl, of course. <laughs> I first saw Jackie at the Wildenstein Gallery on Madison Avenue in May 1967. She had big, wide eyes, and she whispered softly, and she hardly gave interviews. And it was her mystique that created her glamour, her mystique and we want to know more about her. And that's the great thing about glamour, mystery. I knew her address, that was the good thing, 1040 Fifth Avenue. I got better pictures at her apartment, nobody in the way, and she was my favorite ideal subject because she would be full of life, she would move, and I was good at capturing movement, and I liked people in action, being themselves. I don't know how many pictures of Jackie I got. There's so many, it might be a million. Uh, I just don't count my pictures. Jackie went to Central Park on a bike with John Jr. on a bike. I got the information from the doorman next door. And I got them coming down the path. Jackie says, oh, it's you again. She ordered the Secret Service agent smash his camera, but he didn't smash my camera. But she sent two other agents after me to get the film. I sued her for interfering with my livelihood, or the agents were pushing me around, interfering. And the outcome of that was bad. I had a restriction of 50 yards from Jackie, and I couldn't go near her apartment for 100 yards. But I appealed, and this was brought down to 25 feet. I made a tape measure and I extended it with Jackie. It's a joke. That's why I broke the injunction 25 feet. And I said that in the trial. I said, it's impractical because there's people in the way, objects in the way, and I can't operate 25 feet away. There was a model, Joy Smith, who needed portfolio pictures. And I'm a fool for beauty. I did it for her free. So I said, I'll pick you up, and we go to Central Park. Maybe I'll discover Jackie. And as we left the park, Jackie comes out the back entrance and walks toward Madison Avenue on 85th Street. Then she turns north. And on the corner, I did a brilliant thing. I took a taxi because you have to hide to get the off-guard picture. And between 89th and 90th, 
I took two shots from the back window, but she didn't see me or hear me because of the noise. And then the driver did something I didn't ask. He blew his horn. He was interested in Jackie. And Jackie turns at the corner, 90, and I get my windblown Jackie. Beautiful. The exclusive picture, spontaneous, off guard, unrehearsed. But Jackie doesn't see who I am because I have the camera in front of my face. But the moment I get out of the taxi, oh, she knew me and put the glasses on. And I got her another block from 90th to 91st. And then she turned west. And then I gave one of my cameras to Joy Smith. I said, take a couple of pictures of me. I pre-focused the camera 15 feet. And she got two great shots of me running after Jackie. And I shot Jackie from behind. And then Jackie turns around and says, are you pleased with yourself? I said, yes, thank you, and goodbye, I left. I call it my Mona Lisa, because the smile was on her eyes and lips, the beginning of the smile, and she had no makeup and no hair do, natural beauty, the hair blowing in the wind, nice soft light, what was the most true about her was that she had innate style. Whatever she wore, whether it was this season's, last season's, or some 50-year-old piece that she pulled out of her closet looked great. And the persistence of the image of Windblown Jackie proves that because it doesn't matter. It's almost an undateable photograph. It was the iconic photograph of the American celebrity aristocracy, and it created a genre. Granted how intrusive the paparazzi have become in the years since Windblown Jackie was taken, I think that we can look at Rangalella as relatively benign. And, you know, the question is where do you draw the line? How can you sleep at night when you do this for a living is a valid question, and either you can sleep at night or you can't. I never felt guilty photographing Jackie. It's true that I pushed the First Amendment to the limits, perhaps, but that's what it takes. And I don't think it's immoral or bad. I think it was great. And I'm glad that I preserved these images where no one else did. I did it.